Jesus. How many know that great things can happen in Jesus' name? We are gathered here today in the name of Jesus to lift up the name of Jesus. I'm thankful that when we call on his name, mountains can move, chains can be loosed, addictions can be broken in the name of Jesus. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Darkness made a fool of death. 
thankful for the name of Jesus that I can call on him in my darkest hour hallelujah aren't you thankful for the outpouring of God's spirit aren't you thankful for his spirit that lives within you amen aren't you thankful that you've got the Holy Ghost amen let's sing that song Just like the 
you glad you got the Holy Ghost just like the Bible says just like they did it on the day of Pentecost when God poured out his spirit upon the people of God I'm thankful that his spirit is indwelling in us just like it did back then amen we went to the water and got baptized in his precious name amen the name of Jesus I'm thankful amen that we did it just like the Bible says just like they did it in the Bible amen Nobody in the Bible was ever baptized any other way but in the name of Jesus. Thankful that's the way I did it too. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This time we'd like to invite our choir to come and prepare to sing. Also like to invite our ushers to come as they prepare to take up our offering. So grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Worshiping the Lord with the saints of God. Amen. Lifting up the name of Jesus. Let's go before the Lord in prayer for our offering. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, once again for the opportunity, Lord Jesus, to give what is rightfully yours, Lord Jesus. Lord, in our tithes and in our offering, Lord Jesus, we pray, God, that you would bless both the gift and the giver, Lord Jesus. May these gifts, Lord Jesus, go to the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord Jesus to reach a lost and dying world, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your precious name, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. As you give, would you worship with our choir as we sing?
because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that your name is written in glory? Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being the author and the finisher of my faith. Amen. I'm thankful to have my name written over in glory. Amen. Hallelujah. We serve a great God. Amen. You may be seated. We'd like to take a moment and greet each of our guests. Aren't we glad to have all of our guests in the house of the Lord? Amen. If you're a guest here today, we count it a privilege that you've chosen to be with the Pentecostals today. We do have one request of all of our first-time guests, and that is that you not make it a one-time occasion, but that you come again and worship the Lord with us. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to ask our ushers to come. We're going to dismiss our children. I know uh, we have a special day for our children today. It is, uh, they get to be outside. It's a beautiful day today, so we're going to dismiss our children. If you'll just follow the lead of our ushers, amen, as our children are dismissed. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Amen. That's what we're here for. Let's lift up the name of Jesus.
can you lift up your hands and magnify the Lord a moment? Come on, if you've ever experienced a miracle that you can contribute to God, can you just praise Him a moment? Come on, if you've ever received healing in your body, can you just take a moment and say thank you for it? If God has ever made a way in your life, can you take this opportunity to say, God, I acknowledge and I thank you for it today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I feel sorry for people who don't believe in miracles. They're missing out on so much. I see it all the time. This room is full of people. I could literally, they could stand up here and line through the back door and tell you miracle after miracle, verifiable miracles in their life because they know that God is still a miracle worker. People in service today that said the doctors give up on me, but God had another plan for me. It was a closed door, but God opened it for me. There wasn't a way that I could see, but God made a way because he's a miracle worker. And I am so excited amen it's why pentecostals are they're a lively bunch they're an excitable bunch we don't make no bones about it amen you're if you fall asleep in a pentecostal service you probably do need to see a doctor it's because we really believe what we're singing <laughs> we really because we've seen it we've experienced it we've seen it in ourselves we've seen it in others and so man what could be greater than seeing people receive a miracle and their lives changed amen God bless you. You may be seated. We are so very glad that you are here today on, of all days, Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday. I mean, is there a better day than that? If you're not familiar with Pentecost, you may not even have known today was Pentecost Sunday. Man, you, you, you just like showed up at the Super Bowl. It's like the greatest day ever. We're, this is the day that every other church celebrates us. Isn't that awesome? They talk about it, and, and God love many of them. They, we love them all, but many of them talk about what they've never experienced. And yet we, every Sunday, every Sunday is really Pentecost Sunday for us, right? We believe in God's Spirit filling us and moving in our congregation and ordering our steps. And So every Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, but it's a great day to celebrate that monumental occasion that was not something to be celebrated as a historical fact. We celebrate days and holidays that, we reflect back on a particular day. Pentecost is not a reflection on one historical event. It's a reflection of an ongoing occurrence that happens in those that are hungry for God's Spirit to move in their life. It can happen today to you, and we can celebrate that today and then for the rest of your life. We celebrate the fact that it's available to anybody and everybody. That's what we're celebrating today, is that God can fill you with this Spirit today. And that is a phenomenal reason to celebrate. We're so glad that you are here, and I am uh, beside myself today to have my good friend Carl Brooks with me in church today. We are just so glad that you and your son and fiance are here today. Man, we, I'm just thrilled you guys are here. Uh, many of you don't know this, but the Bible says give honor to those who deserve honor. And uh, there are people that come into your life, especially when you're young and you don't know what you're doing and you think you know it all. And then you get a little older and you realize, I didn't know anything, not much less all. I didn't know anything. Uh, my wife and I had just come off the evangelistic field traveling around. We were evangelizing or vandalizing probably was my, probably closer to the reality. We were trying, trying to figure out how to preach and people were uh, gracious enough to let us practice on them. That's really the reality of it, to be honest with you. And they paid us for it, you know, not handsomely, I don't mind telling you, but we, we put gas in the vehicle. We came off the evangelistic field. We decided it was time to plant a church with my father here in Fuquay, and um, I needed a job. And so uh, Carl Brooks, uh, somehow, and I, I'm not even sure how the connection was made. It was, we were, had mutual friends, but he stuck his neck out for a young, skinny, know-nothing don't still don't know much but knew even less than kid to work inside of a flooring store with him and uh there's been days carl i've nearly cursed you for that but <laughs> nonetheless it started a progression that i believe was divinely orchestrated by god the bible says 
he orders our steps and I believe that was divinely orchestrated by God and uh, from there God began to bless and, and of course it was then that eventually led to uh, the career that I have now which allows me so much flexibility and has blessed me and my family so very much which in turn has blessed this church and so uh, in a way that you may not have ever understood or realized until this morning but Carl you've got a lot to do with everything that you see here today because that career allowed me to invest wholly into this church. As you know, we don't take a salary out of this church. We've never taken a salary out of this church. And the reason is Carl put me on a path from a career standpoint, helped me, spoke up for me. Uh, God eventually blessed, and, and, that's, and that was a huge, huge blessing. And, uh, and then not only that, we came off the evangelistic field, and we needed somewhere to live. And uh, Carl and Marcia were so gracious to... They had a condominium in Garner, and uh, we rented that from them way below market value. I don't mind telling you that either. It's hard to find a place to rent when you ain't got a job. <laughs> so, Carl, you were either uh, very trusting or not very smart. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that, was, that was awesome, and, and we had some good memories. That was where we brought Cyrilla home. Macy, Lord have mercy. It does, don't it? It's like time is... So anyway, we had some good times, and, we, and it, was, it was awesome. And so, Carl, thank you for being here today. I mean, on Pentecost Sunday, what a great, great day. I want to say thank you to the men who um, was with me on our men's trip yesterday. So we uh, kayaked 10 miles down the Cape Ri uh, Fear River yesterday, had a great time, got burnt, slammed up by the sun, but we had a great, great time. And uh, so, Brother Chuck Zoya, where you at, brother? Wait, that guy right there... I know he doesn't look like Mr. Atlas, but I'm telling the guy, he literally kayaked 10 miles down the river yesterday and he hung right with us all the way. Man, I was impressed. I'm impressed. So uh, we had a great, great time. Thank you for uh, that wonderful time. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm certain that our kids are probably not too eager for us to pick them up today they're going to be outside in this beautiful weather well if i thought i could get by with it we would just we'd have church out there but covid taught us that's not as cool as it sounds <laughs> parking lot services was all right but boy it was nice to get back in the ac wasn't it uh, john 14 and 16 and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever verse 17 is what I want you to pay particular attention to even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but ye know him why for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you Notice the progression. He walks with you now, but it's not always going to be that way. One day he will live inside of you. And that in, in a nutshell is what Pentecostals believe. We believe that God should live inside of you. Amen. John said the reason we know that is because we know him. Today I want to minister to you just for a few minutes today. The truth of Pentecost. The truth of Pentecost. Can you put your Bibles down, lift your hands, and ask the Lord to open our ears and hearts. God, we thank you for the power and anointing of your word. Now let us receive that. Help us to receive that and retain that which you would have us to retain and keep and carry home with us and change our lives through the word of God today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody say amen. God bless you. you may be seated. I want to open today with a statement that I'm going to have each of you repeat with me. Say this with me. The truth of things is the only refuge from the look of things. Say it again because it's going to be the catalyst for our time together. The truth of things is the only refuge from the look of things. Truth is all that matters. Truth is the only thing worth discussing. Truth is the catalyst behind every follower of Jesus Christ. There is something that followers of Christ literally have that they build their life around, 
And that is, you cannot go with what you see. You cannot go with what is, uh, appears to be obvious. Because there are so many times in our life when it seems very obvious that there is doom and gloom. And there is things that cannot be overcome. But the reality of it is, truth is the refuge from the way that things look. Thank God for truth today. There is, and there always has been, an absolute truth. Now, regardless of the prevailing thinking of our day, most of um, our world, most of them believe and are leaning towards the idea that truth is whatever you say it is. It can be different for whoever may be stating it. You say truth can be different for this person and that person, and truth is relative to your situation. That's the prevailing thinking of our day. Despite a world that utterly despises absolutes, brothers and sisters, I tell you, there is a truth that does govern us all. There is a truth, according to God's Word, that one day we will all be held accountable to, whether we want to realize it or deny it today. It doesn't change the fact that truth still remains. Right? How does that play out in our world today? Well, there's a man and there's a woman and that's it. Right? That's true. There's wrong and there's right and there's no in-between. And so you don't get to just state truth the way you would like for truth to be. You don't, just like, you don't get to say, hey, I don't like that. That's inconvenient. I don't like when the preacher preaches on that because I'm doing that and that steps on my toes. Well, that doesn't change the fact it's true. And the whole point of church is for us to draw closer to God, right? And not to adapt God's Word or, or morph God's Word into our lifestyle. It is to change our life and our actions and our thought and conduct to be more like Christ Jesus. And that's what truth does. It should change us. And that is why knowing truth is so very important, even in your everyday life. Roughly 15 years ago, psychologists finally discovered that there is an inseparable link between the way you think and the way you feel. The way you feel about something is based on what you think about it. The way you feel about something is, is truly and completely based on your thought process regarding it. It was called the science of cognition. And of course, with so many other things that scientists and psychologists discover, it can actually be traced back to Scripture long before they came onto the scene. And so really it's a rediscovery. You know, as followers of Christ, we see something and we read about it. We see in the paper, we read a book about it. And somebody's touting this new discovery. And you're like, you know, I've read that somewhere before. Where did I see that before? And so they've been saying for years that there is an inseparable link between the way you feel and what you think. And that is why knowing the truth was the primary theme in the ministry of Jesus. John chapter 8 and verse 31 says, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. Someone say, know the truth. And because of what you know, the truth shall make you free. The reason I feel liberated, the reason I know I'm liberated is because I know the truth. And the truth is what sets me free. I love that song the choir sang. I am who I am because the I am said I who. I don't, I don't define myself by my mistakes. I, I don't look at myself in my worst moment and say that's who I am. But rather I am defined by who Jesus says I am. He says I'm an overcomer. He says I can be victorious. He says I can live an abundant life. And he is the one that defines me because he is truth. And so knowing that truth sets me free. So what you know determines how you feel. It is why some people look at religion and they see restrictions and others see freedom. People from the outside, followers of Christ, they look in at people who follow Christ and go to church on a regular basis and they read their Bible. And they don't do certain things. They look at that. Man, that just seems very restrictive. It just seems like you don't have any fun. It feels like you, you don't get to do a lot of the things that you want to do. And followers of Christ are like, man, they look out there and they go, boy, it just seems so restrictive to have sin and tell you when to get up and when to go to bed, to be bound by alcohol and to be bound by this and be chained to that. That's so restrictive. The reality of it is when you know the truth, the truth shall make you 
you free. It's the freedom and the liberty of doing exactly what we want to do, but making a conscious decision. I'm going to do what God asked me to do. I'm going to live my life according to His Word. And in that truth, there's real liberty and there's real freedom. Knowing how God feels about you, knowing what the Word says about your situation, knowing that forgiveness is truly available, Knowing that God feels the emptiness inside, He restores, He redeems, and He sets us free. That is a knowledge that is liberating. Much of our anxiety and worry and stress and sleeplessness stems from us believing untruths and those feelings we get from that. The anxiety and stress we often encounter is because we are believing, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, a lie about something. Untruths. And that brings us anxiety and worry. And that is why the truth is so liberating. When I know what God truly says about me and my situation, it relieves much of my anxiety. Truth must be the driving force behind your entire life. When you start believing truth, when you start believing the truth about yourself, When you start believing the truth about the way God feels about you. When you start believing the truth about Scripture. When you start believing the truth about heaven and hell. And when you start believing the truth about what God says about this world. And and the reward that awaits us. It is an entirely liberating experience for us all. Because of the truth. We're living in a culture that deems it very unsophisticated to believe in an absolute truth. Those who believe in absolute truth are being marginalized in our society. As radical, as uh, narrow-minded, as homophobic. And you're like, well, you know, I don't know. I'm just going on what the Word says, and the Word has never let me down. I know the Word is true, and so all I can tell you is what the Word says. Most preachers, if the world continues as it is, will be in danger of being thrown into jail for hate speech when all they're really doing is preaching the Word of God. The truth doesn't change. Truth changeth not. Our world, our culture, our people, and the things we we encounter every day, that changes. But brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, the Word is unchangeable. It is what it is, and it is the truth. And if you believe it, and if you obey it, and you pattern your life against it, I promise you, you'll find true liberty and freedom. I didn't say acceptance. I didn't see admonishment out there. I didn't say a a career move up in your life. But what I did say is that you'll be in a relationship with God that will bring you inner purpose and inner peace and you'll have a prosperity inwardly that you may not have ever experienced any other way because of knowing that truth so truth is whatever in our world you need it to be to suit your purpose truth is whatever it needs to be able to get someone to do what you want them to do no longer does truth rule supreme In fact, we live in a world that the primary purpose of words are no longer to communicate fact-based reality. They are simply there to help us achieve whatever goal we are trying to accomplish. If you're trying to get a promotion, it's okay to lie and steal. Right? That's what the world tells us. If you're trying to impress someone, it's okay to exaggerate. Right? If you've ever, and I haven't, but I've talked to enough people that have, you've ever tried online dating, you'll know it's fair game. You can say whoever you want to be. And so if you're trying to impress someone, it's okay to exaggerate. If you're trying to get more tax breaks, it's okay to cheat. Right? Because truth is relative. You can do whatever you want to do. And so no longer does truth rule supreme in our world. I was talking to Carl before uh, church. It's funny. Carl and I built an entire career around primarily just telling the truth, right? We weren't necessarily the smartest guys in the room. We didn't necessarily have all the knowledge, but here's what we discovered. People appreciate you telling them the truth. Carl and I, we worked in a very fast-paced, crazy, chaotic uh, flooring store, and, and people would call in, and we'd be like, they would say, hey, we need this job installed today. Can you get someone out there? And 10 guys before us would be like, oh, yeah, we're gonna make it happen, we're gonna make it happen. Knowing they weren't gonna make it happen. Knowing that we didn't have anybody that could do it. And Carl and I kind of said, you know what? Let's just tell them the truth and let's see what happens. Nope, we're not going to be there today. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Thank you. Hang up the phone. And there was respect there. Right? There was rapport built there simply for telling the truth. 
Why is that? Because someone that's willing to tell you the truth is so rare. It is a rare and prized commodity. And sadly enough, people go to church and they're not even told the truth there. The preacher will tell him whatever he's got to say to keep them putting dollars in the bucket and showing up. But the reality of it is if you stand behind this pulpit and you call yourself a man of the cloth, you don't have the option of saying anything other than what's in this book. I'm not here for a popularity contest. I'm not trying to get voted in. I'm not trying to get a new Cadillac. I've got to stand before God one day and say, I told them people the truth. I told them exactly what your word says. Each of us are held accountable to what the word of God God says. Truth is everything. And truth is definitely everything when you're talking about your relationship with God. Truth is built around primarily two things. Number one, in the Bible, truth is a person. Someone say a person. John 14 and 6. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So when we think of truth, we often think of it as an abstract set of facts or a collection of knowledge. When we think of truth, we think of a collection of certain data. But the truth ultimately is a person. When Jesus said, I am the truth, he wasn't just saying, I never tell a lie. We know he doesn't. But it goes deeper than that. In the Hebrew mind and in the meaning of the scripture, when Jesus says, I am the truth, what he really meant and what he was saying is uh, that everything he says becomes truth. When he states it, it becomes an actuality. When it comes out of his mouth, regardless of what you thought, regardless of what you've seen, regardless of what you've experienced, or what anybody else has told you, Jesus said, I am the truth, not because I'm just stating predetermined facts. I am the truth because when it comes out of my mouth, it instantly happens. For he was God manifested in the flesh. And when he spoke this world into existence, that same power was in the body of Jesus Christ. And when he would state something, it instantly became true. And so truth, is a person. God is true because He always comes true. How many know that to be true? It's why Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. Jesus was God coming true. Jesus was God coming true. Luther described God in the Old Testament like this. He said God in the Old Testament was like a man muttering through his beard. And so people were trying to understand what God was saying, but it was kind of like a little kingdom, a little mountain. You ever talk to somebody who had bad cell phone signal? Man, will anything drive you crazier than that? And you're like having this important conversation, and all of a sudden, like, you're like, ah, you break it up, you break it up. And then you'll finally get them back, and they'll say, have a good day. And you're like, ah. Right? Especially if you're in an argument, like you're, you're, you're debating your wife on the phone. you got a really good point. It cuts out. And it only cuts back in when she's talking. That devil, man, I'll tell you what. And you're like, boy, you're giving her the business. And then she's like, you were breaking up. Now, you may not have been. Who hasn't used that trick? God in the Old Testament was like trying to communicate with man. Luther said it was like man talking through his beard. Or it might have been like, Talking to someone who had bad cell signal. And so you could only get parts and pieces of the conversation. It was God trying to talk to man. But when God made himself into flesh, when the baby was born and he walked among us, he became truth. He was God coming True. And now, everything we didn't understand, all those prophecies, all those things said in the Old Testament that mankind was trying to wrap their mind around and really understand, when that baby was born in a manger, it was God becoming clear, there was clarity, there was truth, and now instantly we understand and know that was God robed in flesh. And now we can walk with Him, and we can talk with Him, and we will know that on Pentecost Sunday we celebrate the fact that He can live in inside of us uh, he became truth uh, God became truth in the form of Jesus 
2 Corinthians 1 and 20 reminds us of that when it says, For all the promises of God were in Him. Someone say, in Him. Who? In Jesus. All the promises of God came true in Jesus. Jesus was God coming true. The actuality of His promises. So we know truth is a person. Secondly, we know truth is the word about that person. The word about that person. The word that conveys information about that person. So, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is true. It's teaching about Jesus Christ. Therefore, we know the Bible is truth. It's the teaching about Jesus Christ. The Bible is truth because it was governed and protected by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter 1 and 21 reminds us of that. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. They didn't will this thing to existence. It wasn't just somebody sitting on a mountain writing random words. It was not by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so the words about that person, about truth, are true as well. Truth is the word about that person. So we know the Bible is inerrant. What does the word inerrant mean? It means incapable of being wrong. There's a lot of people that try to prove the Bible wrong, and then years later they look very foolish. This has been around a while, right? Remember how you were 18, you thought you knew everything, and your dad was just dumb, and he didn't know anything, and then he, man, he got really smart in just a few short years? Like, man, Dad, he figured it out. There's a lot of people that think the Word isn't relative and the Word isn't true and the Bible isn't accurate. And then they later on in life, and the more they discover and the more they dig up and, and the more that they, quote, discover, the more they realize not only is the Bible historically accurate, it's geographically accurate, and more importantly than any of that, it's spiritually accurate. And so if I obey the Word of God, I know that one day when the trump sounds, my feet will leave the ground and I'll spend eternity with the one who loves me unconditionally. And so the word is true. When we believe and obey scripture, it unlocks all the promises held in that scripture. It was true of the people in the Bible, and it's true of you today. Every single person, listen to me preach today, it's true of you today. When you believe and obey the Bible, everything the Bible says about promises belongs to you belongs to. It's why faith is so powerful. Faith unlocks all of the promises in the Bible. If you don't believe and you don't have faith, this is just another book. Might as well be the encyclopedia. Might as well be some other random book. But the moment you start believing every word in there is true, I believe that the creator of the universe divinely inspired every single word that is on the pages of this book. Immediately, everything that is in this book has your name on it. Every promise, everything that it says suddenly becomes available to you because of that faith. So I'll read of an account of when someone actually believed that and it happened, we go back to a little known prophet named Joel in the Old Testament. Notice what he wrote. Joel 2 and 28. 2 and, 28 and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And my favorite part of the verse, your old men shall dream dreams. There's still a place for me. <laughs> There's still a place. I'm still in the book. And you young guys, y'all see visions. I'll pour out my spirit. Now fast forward hundreds of years. There's a hundred people gathered in an upper room. After Jesus has ascended. And these 120 people, they believed the truth. Of this prophecy. They believed every word of it. They, they held it as truth. It wasn't just something they, they seen or heard randomly. They heard and believed it as truth. And so in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord and one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. 
And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 12. And they were all amazed. And these were the people standing around. These were the people who came to a Pentecostal service for the first time. Right? These are the folks that show up on Easter. And they got their Easter dress on. And they're like, where are we going to church? And then like 15 minutes into Pentecostal service, they're like, what in the world is going The Bible says they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying what one to another, what meaneth this? Right? What meaneth this? Others mocking. How many have ever been mocked because you're a Pentecostal? Now, my grandpa would tell you, tell you that you got it easy. Everybody wants to be in a spirit-filled church nowadays. Growing up, Pentecostals were the only people that had drums in church. That's it. And we were holy rollers, and we were crazy, and we handled snakes, and we've heard it all. But ain't it good to know it's been going on a long time? What meaneth this? What, what does this mean? And then others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Now, wouldn't that be an easy explanation? They're just drinking too much. And I'm sure there's been people that walked out of Pentecostal churches thinking them people have definitely been taking a lot of communion. <laughs> like, those folks are definitely on something. And so they were mocking. Now, why were these men mocking? Why were they doubting? I guess the question could be asked even now, why is there so much skepticism regarding Pentecost? Why after 2,000 years are there still people who mock Pentecost and quite frankly Pentecostals? Somehow, despite there being over 305 million people in the world right now claiming this experience, Pentecostals are often viewed in the same light as people who see UFOs or Bigfoot. You know what I'm talking about, folks. You're on the job and you're standing at the coffee pot and... Get to talking about church. Oh, where do you go to church? Oh, I'm a Pentecostal. Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh, now, wait just a minute. So you're one of them. Like, I mean, I, I believe John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I believe we walked on the moon. I mean, I'm not, I'm not crazy here. I mean, it's, it's right there. <laughs> just because your church don't do it don't mean it don't happen. Uh, we don't say that, right? We're not trying to condemn anybody, but we are not going to deny the fact that God does do it. And so, why is there so much skepti skepticism? Because, remember, how you feel about something is based on what you know about something. You can't get mad at somebody who doesn't know. You can understand the skepticism. Why would these men in Acts chapter 2 be so alarmed, so concerned, accuse others of being drunk? They didn't know anything about it. The people in the upper room were clearly acting different. By the looks of things, they were drunk. This was different. This was unusual. This wasn't the normal, formal temple praying. This wasn't the Sadducees, and they were saying all the perfect words and praying loud in the streets. That's all they had never known. And then suddenly, 120 people gather up in this upper room, and it starts getting loud and rambunctious, and then they start speaking in tongues, and it's like, oh, my Lord, what is wrong with these people? They didn't know. And so I return back to my opening quote from George MacDonald. The truth of things is the only refuge from the look of things. And Peter was about to drop a truth bomb. He was about to bring truth into the conversation. And the beautiful thing about truth, truth brings clarity. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily agree, but truth brings clarity. God's word brings understanding, and Peter was about to bring God's word into the equation. Verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose. Now they might be a little inebriated on the spirit, but they're not like you think. Right? As you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But here's where he brings truth into the equation. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Remember that Old Testament prophet way back in the Old Testament when you didn't really understand it, when there wasn't a lot of clarity. Peter said, this 
is that. And he repeated the words, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my servants and upon my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Peter said, there's nothing to be alarmed at here. We haven't recreated some new religion. We're not crazy. We're not off our rocker. We've not been drinking. All that we are doing is claiming a truth that Joel stated back in the Old Testament. Joel said, I'm going to pour out God. I'm going to pour out my spirit on the last days and everybody can have it. It's available to anyone. And so I want to tell you today, you don't have to dip your head as a Pentecostal. You don't have to be ashamed of being someone who believes in the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You need to know you're standing on the word of a prophetic utterance even in the Old Testament and one that Peter repeated in Acts chapter 2. It's for you. It's for everybody. Peter proclaimed the truth. He proclaimed the truth of Pentecost. What was Peter saying? He said, we believe in Scripture. We believe in truth. Prophet Joel proclaimed, so we, because we believe in that truth, because we believe in that truth, that truth can be true in us. Believe in obedience to the truth of Scripture activates the truth of that Scripture. Listen to Pastor when I tell you, when you believe in truth, truth works in you. You've heard me use the analogy before. People go to the doctor. The doctor gives them medicine. They don't take the medicine. They get mad at the doctor. <laughs> I ain't feeling no better. I've had doctor friends tell me, you know, people get upset and they come back, you know, two weeks later and like, I'm telling you right now, I don't feel any better. I feel worse. Well, have you been taking your medicine? No, that stuff don't work. <laughs> right? The truth only works if you believe and obey. The Word of God works, and it's activated when you say, hey, you know what? I've never received the Holy Ghost. I've never had that experience in my life. I believe that I could receive it. I believe, according to what that preacher was saying, it was an Old Testament prophecy. Peter's restated in Acts chapter 2, and 305 million people can't be wrong. I might as well be one too. And when you believe on that, it's activated in your life, and you release the hands of God, and He can give you that very gift that will change a life forever. And that's why we celebrate Pentecost. That's what this day and every other day is about, that God feels His people with the Spirit. And so, Peter goes on in Acts 2 and 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Notice the transformation. How did they go from, ha, ah, you're crazy, you're drunk, to, oh man, truth did that. The way you feel about something is directly linked to what you know about something. You ever made fun of somebody and then found out they had gone through a terrible situation in their life and and they'd gone through a tragedy, and then you're like, oh, man, I can't believe I, I, can't believe I, I was saying that about them. I can't believe. No wonder they're like that. That's the way those in the upper room felt. They were making fun of them, and then when they heard this prophecy, and, and then when the truth was proclaimed, they went from making fun to being convicted and pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, what is the proper response to Pentecost? This right here, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What a great promise. What a powerful promise. You want to know why we baptize people in the name of Jesus and that formula? It's right here. That's what the Bible tells us to do. It's truth. Verse 39, equally as powerful for those that come to church today. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are afar off, even, even as many as, as the Lord our God shall call. If you tell somebody that the Holy Ghost is not for them anymore, you are denying that God is calling them. You cannot say to them, God definitely, he'll speak to you. 
God will call you. God will talk to you in prayer. God will definitely call you. But the Holy Ghost is not for you. You are denying the voice of God in someone's life when you tell them the Holy Ghost is not for them because the promise is unto you, to your children, to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you feel the calling of the Lord in your life, if you hear Him speaking to you, if you hear Him drawing you, if dealing with you, can I tell you the Holy Ghost is for you. Don't let anybody tell you that it's an accessory, that it was only for those in the upper room. What I want to tell you today, it's for everybody that lives and breathes today. When you believe this truth enough to obey it, it will happen in you. John 14 and 16 says, And I will pray the Father, you heard me read this, and he shall give you another comforter that abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Why can't they receive it? Why are there so many churches that don't believe this? Because it seeth not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. I promise you if someone er earnestly seeks God, this will become evident to them. I had for many years a, a neighbor friend of mine, great man, great man. And he went to another church and they, let's just say, didn't necessarily espouse to the beliefs that the Holy Ghost was for people today. And so he and I had conversations and we were great friends. And he came to me one day after mowing his lawn and he kind of looked around like this right here, like he was wondering if the FBI was looking or something, you know. And I was like, man, what's he about to lay on me here? I'm like, are you a secret agent or what's on? And he said, preacher, I got to tell you something. He said, we had a little prayer meeting at our church last night. I was like, great. He said, man, something happened in that prayer meeting that ain't ever happened in that church before. I said, well, what happened? He said, man, the preacher was over there praying, and I was praying with him, and all of a sudden, he said, we felt this powerful presence come down in that prayer meeting. He said, all I knew to do was lift my hands, and I looked over, and my preacher had his hands lifted up, and he said, all of a sudden, I started saying things I never knew I could say. He said, I felt this incredible power all over me. He said, I tell you, it changed my life. He said, I, I asked my preacher, what was that? And this was the exact words. God be my witness. And I won't even say his name because you might know him. He said, sir, this is the pastor. That was the Holy Ghost. He said, now please don't tell anybody else in this church that happened. Or they'll kick me out of this church. If God is calling and dealing and you obey the word of God, I promise you, whether it's in a, a prayer closet somewhere on the side of the road in a hotel room or at the altar at a church, you lift up your hands. I promise you that promise can be to you, to your children, to those that are afar off, even as the many as the Lord our God shall call. Are you thankful that the Holy Ghost is available to you today? I'm thankful that God's spirit can feel humanity today. And I'm about finished. John 14, 19. Yet a little while, the world seeth me no more, but you see me. Because I live, you shall live also. Notice what John 14 and 20 says. At that day. What day was he referring to? Pentecost. At that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, ye in me. And notice this. I in you. Man, what a reason to celebrate Pentecost. Because that day. Someone say that day. I in you. What's better than walking with Jesus? Jesus being on the inside of you. I hear people all, talk, all the time like, man, I would have loved to have been there when Jesus walked on the water. Man, I'd love to have seen that miracle. I'd, that would have been pretty awesome. But what's better than Jesus living inside of you? And he can go anywhere that you go. And no matter what you're going through or what you're dealing with, you can instantly call on the name of Jesus. And that spirit inside of you can lead and guide and direct. And even more importantly than that, the Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it, if it dwell in you, it shall quicken your mortal body. So if that spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, in the Holy Ghost, you too can be quickened. You too can be resurrected. You too can meet Him for eternity in that prepared place. And so I can tell you it never occurred to Peter years after the upper room that there would be anything other than a Pentecostal experience. I can promise you Peter never envisioned a non-Pentecostal church. <laughs> Peter 
was like, man, who wouldn't want this? He never envisioned a non-Pentecostal church. It's not a denomination. It's an experience. Who cares what's on the sign out there? Being Pentecostal don't make you, it don't make you any better than anybody. It doesn't take you to heaven. It don't make you holier than anybody else. All that is signifying is we believe that the experience that took place in Acts chapter 2, it happens here. And if you want to experience that, you can come here and you will experience that. Peter never envisioned anything other than what happened in the upper room to happen every time people got together. In Peter's mind, a non-Pentecostal church would have been like a non-electrified city in 2022. Like, why? Why? Why wouldn't you just flip the light on? Like, why wouldn't you just plug in and just, why are you out there walking behind that lawnmower? Hey, believe it or not, that's, that's available to you. Peter never envisioned anything other than that. And so Pentecost was not just an event that happened by coincidence or chance. It was planned from the moment that sin entered into the world. The moment sin entered into the world of Garden of Eden until the moment wind began to blow in the upper room and those spirit-filled, spirit-intoxicated, spirit-motivated people hit the streets and Pentecost changed the world. It changed the world. It's more than a name or a church or even a movement. It's an experience. It's God's desire for every single person that is alive today, every man Woman, boy, and girl, it's his desire to fill you with his spirit. Why? Because we're all born sinners, aren't we? Every single one of us. Jesus said because of that initial birth into sin, you must be born again. Now that's a very cliche word, and we hear that all the time, being a born-again Christian, but the reality of it is that's God's plan for humanity. To be reborn. How are we to be reborn? The Bible says of water and of spirit of water and of spirit that's how you're born again and when you're born again of the water and the spirit the bible says you're a new creature not just a better person not just a little reformed but you're not even the same person that you were before i'm reminded of what jerry clower said about the mom who had 16 kids. Her very large brood of kids lived near a construction site. And in this construction site, they were busy putting a tar roof on a building. And so this mother who had 16 kids lived near this construction site and the men were putting a tar roof on the building. Her youngest son wandered out of her eyesight and he fell into a barrel of tar. Jerry Clower said upon reaching her son and pulling him out of that tar barrel, completely covered from head to toe in sticky tar, she quickly exclaimed, Boy, it'd be easy for me to have another child than clean you up. That's the way God viewed humanity. It'd be easier just to give them a brand new life. It'd be easier just to let them be born again. Start all over. And the power of forgiveness and the power of baptism is you can live the most wretched, awful life, make a million mistakes as we all have, And the moment you ask God to forgive you of those things, it's forgotten. And then he burials them in his name. When you come out of that water, you're one of his. Then he fills you with his spirit. And when that angel puts that trumpet to his mouth, he sounds that horn. The Bible says the magnet that pulls your ground, that your feet off the ground will be the Holy Ghost. Not your good deeds, not what church you go to, but the fact that you allow God to fill you with this Spirit. That same Spirit, the Bible says, that resurrected Christ will lift you as well if it dwell in you. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you today, everyone that's here, 
Not only is the Holy Ghost for everyone, it should be an experience that everyone has on a regular basis. You shouldn't go too long without praying to the point that God fills you and, and renews you in His Spirit. Don't ever let your relationship with God become a formality. Don't ever let it become such a habit that you lose the sense of all oh, that God of the universe literally filled that vacancy in my heart. When God created man, sin blew a hole right through his heart. Think of a gaping hole in the heart of humanity. And what do we do? We run around trying to fill that hole. Let me go over here and drink a little while. Let me run from this relationship to this relationship. Let me fill that gaping hole. Let me make a bunch of money. Let me climb the career path. Let me. And what they're trying to do is fill that gaping hole that sin blew through their heart. But the only thing that fits into that spot is the Spirit of God. That piece of the Creator that created us initially, that's the only thing that when it clicks in, you're like, wow, that's what I've been missing. That's what I was searching for. That's where I was looking. Stand with me today. Take a moment, if you would, bow your heads and close your eyes. Pentecost is all about giving God the opportunity to change you. I don't know anybody that don't need a little change. If you came to church today and you arrived and you're the essence of perfection, you sit on the pedestal of self-righteousness, man, I want to shake your hand after church. I want your autograph. But I can tell you, as for me, I come to church to change. I come to church to be better, to be more like God. The whole purpose of coming to church for me is God get everything out of my heart that don't belong there and put whatever inside of me needs to be there. That's what church is all about. That's what Pentecost is all about. And so I challenge you today if God has filled you with this spirit you ought to celebrate that today. How do I celebrate it pastor? Pastor by talking to God and letting Him renew you in that experience. If you've never experienced the infilling of God's Spirit, man, what a great day to do it. To say, God, I repent of my sins. Repentance is the way we clean our heart out. You can't move God in to a dirty heart. Right? Repentance says, God, get everything out of me that don't belong there. I'm sorry for every mistake I've made. And then once you've repented of your sins sincerely, you lift your hand and say, God, I desire your presence and your spirit to feel me. And you let God feel your heart. It's the most powerful experience you'll ever know. Life changing. It's transforming. And it's for you. They're going to sing a song of invitation today as is customary. I'll open these altars up to anyone that would like a few moments to talk to God. Not to join the church, not to shake the preacher's hand. This is an opportunity for everyone that calls themselves a believer of Christ and who says, I want to draw closer to Him today. I want to celebrate the fact that Pentecost is available to me. If that's the way you feel, make your way down to this altar today. Come on, that's it. That's it. Join those that are coming right now. Take a friend, lead them to an altar today. Let's talk to God. Beautiful. Come on, that's it. Beautiful. Lift your hand. Say, God, cleanse me. Purify my heart today, God. Forgive me of any iniquity or impurity that's in my life. I desire, God, to please you. I desire to follow after you, God. Come on.
on, it's just you and God right now. That's it. That's it. Eyes closed and hands raised and surrender to God. I surrender to your will. I surrender to your plan, God. I want to follow after you. for somebody next to you right now God would you fill them with your spirit would you minister to them right now God Thank you. Come on, thank you for your spirit right now. Come on, he's pouring his spirit out even now. Come on, lift your hands and ask God to minister to you one more time. Hallelujah. Thank you for your spirit, God. Thank you for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost today. Thank you that it's available to me even now, Lord. 
we thank you for it, Jesus. We thank you for it, Jesus. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise for his word today? Thank you for it, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Remain right where you are at for just a moment. Amen. The Ogden is coming. He's going to make you aware of some very special things. One thing I do want to tell you is tomorrow night, AMT will be hosting a night of worship. If you love to worship God, come tomorrow night for a night of worship. Not going to be a concert. If you want to be entertained, you probably don't want to come. But if you want to come worship God, tomorrow night is a night of worship. AMT will be sponsoring that. Looking forward to being here for that. Amen. Please give Pastor Ogden your undivided attention for the final announcements. God bless you. If you'll remain right where you're at, quickly just uh, share with you a few quick announcements. Uh, our hyphen students will be meeting at Zaxby's in Fuquay uh, for lunch this afternoon, uh, right after the service. So, like all of our hyphen group to be part of that event. Um, tonight is intercessory prayer. It is the most important service we have every month. Every time we have intercessory prayer, God does great things, incredible things, things that cannot be done without prayer and supplication. And we want, we want to invite everyone to be part of that tonight. And um, we ask that you be here tonight at 6 o'clock to be part of our intercessory prayer. Uh, as a reminder, Monday night is Mother's, I mean, Monday, Monday morning is Mother's Prayer at 9.30 a.m., right here in the sanctuary. So we'd like to invite all of our mothers to be part of that. We've, uh, our ladies have been having an incredible uh, prayer sessions on Monday morning. So we invite all of our mothers to be part of that 9.30 a.m. right here in the sanctuary. As Pastor mentioned, Monday night, 7 p.m., our AMT will be having a worship service, not a concert, but a worship service. And we'd invite all of you to be part of that Monday night. We're looking forward to a very special Father's Day coming up June 19th at 10 a.m. We encourage you all to be part of that uh, event, uh, our Father's Day celebration. Uh, if this is your first time in our service, our pastoral team would love the opportunity to meet you right out in the foyer. We have a gift for you just as a thanks for being here with, the, with us here at the Pentecostals. Before we uh, pray in dismissal, we'd like to, while we're praying in dismissal, Pray for these prayer requests. Uh, Giovanni Aguilar, Glenda Harari, Umenzar, and then uh, my son, the Nia Gravis. I want to pray for each of these as we uh, pray in dismissal. Let's do that right now. Lord Jesus, we pray for these prayer requests, Lord. God, we know that you know exactly what the need is before we even ask it. We pray it right now in the name of Jesus. Meet these needs as only you can meet. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, if there's a need of healing, God, you're the healer. If there's a need of deliverance, God, you are our deliverer. God, if there's a need of a mountain to be moved, you're our mountain mover. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Meet these needs as we pray it right now. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for these needs being met. God, as we pray and believe in the name of Jesus, God, we pray for go with each one today, Lord, this afternoon. Bring us back here this evening for intercessory prayer. Lord, as we shake our, our planet, Lord Jesus, with prayer, Lord, for our world, Lord Jesus, our lost and dying world, we pray it in the name of Jesus. Go with each one in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Shake a hand and be friendly on your way out.